The Echoes of the Eye has become regarded as one of the greatest releases of 2021. But is that really true? I felt compelled to provide my thoughts on this DLC because it was one of my most anticipated releases ever. And even so, I have some things to critique. Now I know this video is coming out at the worst possible time, especially since everyone is playing Elden Ring, myself included, but this video has been in my head since the DLC came out. And I will spoil the storyline, since that's where some of my critiques come from. Although if you're watching this, you've likely already played it, or know the ending already, so let's just get on with the video. These are my thoughts on the Echoes of the Eye DLC for Outer Wilds. One thing I found myself noticing about the Echoes of the Eye is there are a lot of aspects that are basically mirrors to the base game, so I will describe this DLC as essentially similar but different. But before that, let's start off with the beginning. The way the devs decided to introduce the DLC to the base game feels very organic and realistic. You go to the observatory and find a new exhibit which leads you to the direction of the DLC area. Just like in the base game, you start off with just a little clue unknowingly provided by your fellow Harthians. And again, there's no real hand-holding. Just details that are not necessarily meant to be clues, but are clues nonetheless. This time around though, instead of being open-ended, the clues lead you toward a single direction, the satellite. It was at this point when I reached the satellite communication tower that I really started to feel the excitement. Personally, I love how this room is presented. The large photos on the walls already get the detective senses tingling. After going through the clues, you head off to look for the satellite itself. Just like the beacon frequencies of the base game, you follow the signal on your signal scope to find your destination. You slowly follow its path and try to reach the position as seen in the suspicious photo. And that's when you see it. The Stranger. It's at this point where the similar but different theme really starts to become apparent. Where in the base game you are primarily exploring planets with your ship, the DLC has you exploring this. A space station cloaked and hidden from view. You once again come across writing like the base game, but you're not able to translate it this time around. It's clear by now that you're dealing with another alien race, a different alien race. You also need to learn how to use their technology, just like the base game. But whereas the Nomai's technology is controlled by direct observation, this technology is controlled by concentrated light. Also, there is a color theme to this technology as well. Where Nomai technology has a purple hue, this technology has a green hue. We can also access the dwelling places of this race, but everything is taller to an unsettling degree. It's also worth noting the difference in style and architecture. Where I would describe the Nomai as a sort of primitive sci-fi, the Stranger has a more rustic fantasy feel. Instead of reading the text of the Nomai, you get your information from slideshows, where the base game's environment changes over time with rising sand or melting ice, the Stranger's environment changes with water levels and structural alterations. Where the base game has you enter a planet with your ship and fly through impossible space, the DLC has you enter on foot and ultimately explore a dream world. Both of these locations are where you find enemies that you will need to avoid. Where the enemies in the base game are blind but stationary until they detect you, the enemies of the DLC are usually moving and will actively seek you out after spotting you from a distance. The Eye of the Universe appears again. But while the concept is practically worshipped in the base game, the symbol is left abandoned, as if fallen from grace in the DLC. You also find the bodies of both alien races. Where the corpses of the Nomai are found scattered around the solar system, on the Stranger they are found grouped together in designated locations. Congregation rooms, as I call them. Both the base game and the DLC have alien NPCs that you can speak to. But where Solanum's encounter is essentially optional, Meeting the prisoner is the only way to bring the end of the DLC. However, they are still similar in that they only exist in a limbo state, because they are both technically deceased. Most importantly, they consider the player a friend, before you witness their demise. And lastly, but also most broadly, this new alien race is incredibly similar to not just the Nomai, but also the Harthians. Most would refer to these aliens based on their appearance, such as owl folk or deer people, or perhaps the strangers or the inhabitants based upon their relationship to the stranger itself. But I would like to propose a different descriptor, the artists. It is clear that this race places emphasis on different types of art. They even appear to watch the slideshows for enjoyment, just like someone would watch a show or a movie. Not to mention that they seem to really enjoy making music. You can hear the music coming from one of their buildings in the shrouded woodlands. 
and at certain locations you can find the instruments themselves, along with a small concert area in the Endless Canyon, to show that they like putting on and watching musical performances. There's also the inclusion of many murals, which often have little details to distinguish hidden paths. There's the icons that explain the different purposes of certain buildings, unlike the Nomai that have often a terminal or a sign with written text to explain these areas. And let's not forget that they also created a simulated world which resembles their homeworld with fantastic detail. So, while the Harthians are the explorers and the Nomai are the scientists, these aliens are the artists. These themes extend to the cultures of each species. The Harthians developed their technology for the sole purpose of exploring the solar system and unlocking its secrets. The probe aids in exploration and providing a better view, the signal scope helps track sounds and radio waves, the ship looks like it has just barely enough capabilities for space travel, and the translator reveals details and text left behind. All of these look like they were slapped together to be overly practical, like, yeah, that's good enough. Meanwhile, the Nomai were driven by the need to learn and understand. Even their language is based on two fundamental aspects, to identify and to explain. They created the Ash Twin Project, the Orbital Space Station, the Black Hole Forge, and the Teleporters. They love to run experiments and use their intellect to study and find the eye of the universe. The artists instead have technology that show a more humble approach. They have that more rustic or fantasy inspired technology like I explained before, as everything is light based. Their doors have an artistic representation of blocking the sun just to open it. Even the rafts get taken through the lifts only when they go under a spotlight, and they use rudimentary pulleys made of hooks and chains. They design their light sources to resemble lanterns, and to communicate, they use staffs to beam visual representations of thoughts into each other's minds. The devices to manipulate the dream world are also more fantastical in nature, like lighting up a bridge into existence, or blowing out a door, or teleporting to a hand sculpture. Since these devices don't exist on the stranger, one can gather that they enjoy a creative artistic representation over hard practical realism. Now of course, this is not to say that the Harthians can't use scientific processes or make music, because they do. Or that the Nomai can't be artistic or consider themselves explorers, because they were. Or that the artists can't run experiments or long to observe the universe, because they did. But those are generally secondary traits, similar but different, remember? Similarities such as these kept popping up as I went through the DLC. So even though it was creative by giving us something new, it still felt like just more Outer Wilds, in a dense format. Not that it's a bad thing, in fact, it's a testament to the formula that the devs have created for it to remain incredibly effective given the similarities. Even if it seemed like a lot of the DLC just took inspirations from the base game. Then again, if Outer Wilds is what you base your game on, how can it go wrong? There are so many parts of the DLC that were perfectly executed. I already explained my feelings on my first playthrough of the DLC up until the reveal of The Stranger, but beyond that I was blown away by the opening sequence. Since the player will begin with following the satellite on their first trip to The Stranger, then you are almost guaranteed to enter through the back, making your first exposure to the inside of The Stranger a wonderful surprise. When I dropped down in the raft and I immediately looked around, my breath escaped me. I remember saying out loud something like, how are these people so damn creative? If you were to enter through the other side of the stranger, the effect would not have been the same. So the positioning was perfectly crafted to ensure that this was the first way players will witness the interior. However, after exploring it the first time around, there's almost no reason to enter through this side of the stranger anymore. In fact, I found entering through the front of the stranger to be more efficient, since the route I would always take was through the hangar, and then immediately through the ghost matter covered building to get the lantern device. You can also use the elevator, which is one of those mind-blowing shortcuts that you get from Dark Souls. But again, I didn't really use it very often, despite the fact that it's a fantastic reveal. So, I would simply use the marker system to autopilot myself to the front every time and just go through the door. But on a different note, another example of fantastic execution but with a letdown is the reveal of information in the form of slide reels. You still get the same process of learning how to use alien technology with these slide reels since it isn't obvious that you need to grab a lantern and place it into the center of the slideshow device. But your flashlight gives you a tiny preview 
as a small but clever hint that it needs a light source to work, just like the rest of the artist's technology. The slideshows themselves show information that you couldn't quite gather from text alone like you do the Nomai, while still limiting the amount of details so they can be revealed later. Emotions, actions, and diagrams are on full display, which lines up with the music at very specific times to produce a memorable effect. The second part of the excellent execution regarding the slide reels is the addition of the forbidden slide rooms themselves. You are likely to find this logo early on, the image of a burning slide reel. It isn't obvious what this means until later, at least to me when I thought it was more symbolic, until you find the room that explains where the burning of the slide reels took place. These rooms are extremely well hidden, and I can tell a lot of work was put into making sure that they wouldn't stand out while exploring. Better yet, even if you found one of the slide rooms by accident, that's only one third of the full picture, and the odds of finding all three by accident are minuscule at best. I also like that in order to get access to the forbidden reels, you need to remove light sources and access the mural in the dark. The theme of going through the dark to find secrets becomes more apparent as you go through your journey. Where this falls apart for me though is why these rooms exist in the first place. It's explained in the reels that after learning about the eye's purpose, the artists grew incredibly angry. So they destroyed the slide reels and burned their churches, even in the dream world. However, it doesn't really explain why they left behind untouched versions of these slides hidden in a not-so-subtle evil portrait mural that they all clearly knew how to access. It seems too much like pandering to the player's need for a puzzle, because I doubt the artists were thinking, Let's leave one of each behind and put a spooky mural to remind whoever stumbles across our hidden space station that they are trespassing in a very hidden area where they need to solve our lock combination to access our hidden projector room that shows them where this room is because we need to show them, whoever they are, that we mean business. The only explanation I could think of was to trap people who wanted to see the truth. However, that's pointless, so that's not a good explanation which is made worse considering that everyone on The Stranger already knows the information on the slides. So even though I accepted it and enjoyed it from a gameplay perspective since each room required a different solution to escape, it did take me out of the experience a bit. Another aspect that gave me a similar feeling was the control room, if you will. This was probably the most disappointing part for me, as I think the devs could have gone a completely different direction with the game, but didn't. And even though I know why they couldn't go down that path, I am still disappointed. Let me explain. Imagine for a moment being in my shoes. I'm walking around, exploring the buildings and being freaked out by the creepy portraits. I find the slide reel and see these guys emerge from the darkness. Then while I come across the room with a table displaying the eye signal blocker, I was like, what is that? Then at some point I find this room filled with bodies, but a single bed is suspiciously empty. Then after I Usain bolted out of that room, I see the station do this. At which point I was like, what the hell is happening? And then I come across this. The trajectory diagram showing the space station going beyond the supernova. And this is what followed. I lean back in my chair. I can feel my heartbeat with how still and pensive my entire being became. I considered all of my options, and all of the clues I've found so far. I pondered what could happen to the stranger, and what could happen to me. My paranoia settled in, so I looked behind me toward the hall to see if I was alone. After partially satisfying my fearful mind, I returned back to the screen, and finally came to the conclusion. To no one else but myself, I uttered the words. I need to shut down the Ash Twin Project and take a different ending. Well, I was wrong. Turns out that's not necessary at all. In fact, if you stop the Ash Twin Project, there are a couple endings you can get, but they're both basically game over screens that say something along the lines of, great, you're stuck on the ship forever now, have fun dying. I was basically making the deduction in my head that the dream world sequence that we see in the game now was going to happen after the supernova. I just assumed that the diagram showed low power, which was not enough to get the station out of range. So naturally, I thought that I would have to provide power to the station in order to escape the supernova. 
The only other power source that we know of in the solar system was the warp core. So at first I thought I would need that. And if not, because it shouldn't be compatible with artist technology, I needed to disable the project anyways since after the supernova, it would reset the loop and I wouldn't be able to explore the quote unquote dark mode of the stranger, which was sure to happen eventually considering the scenes in the trailer. I thought of a possibility of the missing artist still being alive with a long lifespan or something, and chasing me throughout the stranger after the sun explodes, and I have to somehow direct the stranger to the broken probe since it was waiting at the eye. But with the sun gone and low power to the station, everything would go dark, and then the real Dark Souls would begin. I thought it was going to be a completely different ending to the game, with a different way to access the eye. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case. Again, I now know why my theory was not likely, but it felt like such a natural series of events to me. Instead, the probe table just shows that the signal is no longer contained. The flicker of the light just shows that the fins are opening. The missing body is just the prisoner's bed that he left. But the main issue is this damn table. After seeing this thing, my mind jumped to such an incorrect conclusion that it makes me wonder if the devs initially planned for something like this to happen on the ship post-supernova, but ended up changing the plan. As it is now, the only justification is that the artists wanted to escape the supernova, nothing more. There was zero effect on gameplay, or the state of the mystery. It added nothing. The whole opening fins mechanic and this table are utterly useless as a result. It just shows that they knew that the sun was dying and built in a failsafe to avoid it. You don't have to take it into account, you don't need to remember it's even there, or even think about how to change it. It's just another log entry. You still restart the time loop, just without being devoured by the supernova. The main game didn't give me a similar sense of letdown at any point, so this one I remembered vividly. The last aspect that was a mixed bag was the ending itself. I love that you unlock the prisoner's cell by what is essentially abusing bugs and exploits like a hacker, or Neo in the Matrix. Figuring this out was immensely satisfying, using everything you learn to solve the final puzzles without ever knowing the combinations. There are combinations that work, but the game never tells you what they are. So bypassing them will make you feel like a mastermind that will get past any obstacle. Also, I like how the information you relay to the prisoner correlates to how many big discoveries you have recorded on your ship's log. If you go in with a fresh, blank ship log, this sequence is very short and doesn't provide much info. The ending itself, although very understandable and emotional, seemed abrupt and unsatisfying. The prisoner leaves you a final message, essentially saying that they wish they could just explore with the player like friends. However, until it was patched, there was no footprints to show that the prisoner walked into the water, ultimately dying by blowing out his lamp. So it was a bit difficult to determine where he went before that was patched. And truth be told, I tried looking for him the first time around, and I can speak for many players when I said, Is it over? It can't be over. What do I do now? But my issues with the ending run deeper still. It frankly doesn't make sense that the prisoner didn't blow out his lantern long ago. He was stuck in isolation for who knows how long, and surely, he already knows he is long dead on the stranger as well. At some point, he would have snapped and blown it out. But alright, let's just assume that he needed to stay alive because he believed that people needed to know about the Eye of the Universe, and refused to die until he was sure that someone else will somehow come by and set him free so he can explain to them that they need to continue the search for it in his stead. That is the most likely explanation. But you know what doesn't have an explanation? Why the other artists thought to create a large sarcophagus cell within a giant bell tomb to be put underwater and then create a virtual prison of the same tomb but with three giant lots, each with unique security measures, and all of this inside of a virtual dream world that you'll somehow have to access so it can't be unlocked in real life, on the stranger, even though they cloaked the entire station and didn't expect anyone else to find their way in. It seems incredibly unnecessary. Like I get it, they're artists, but they don't have to be that impractical. 
especially considering that the prisoner had zero sympathizers. So there's no chance of someone aiding in his escape. Not to mention that they left his lantern with him. So he could have blown it out at any time. It's like leaving a gun in a solitary confinement cell. So did they want him to kill himself? If so, why go through all the trouble of imprisoning him in both worlds? And that's the problem. It's more pandering to the player's need for a puzzle to solve than it is setting up a believable series of events to work through. Like I said, there was emotional weight to the ending, but the ending falls way below that of the original game. It's not all bad though. However, this next issue needs a whole section of its own. This DLC definitely took a heavier emphasis on the horror aspects of gameplay, and this fact was obvious before the release of the DLC itself. Watching the trailer showed clear tonal shifts into more creepy territory. More serious music, more shots of being in the darkness, and alien technology that is more reminiscent of the occult than machinery. There's the persistent ominous green glow, a quick shot of the fallen Eye of the Universe symbol. All of these hint toward a more dire tone. And then there's the inclusion of a reduced frights option specifically for the DLC making it more obvious than a supernova. Speaking of which, I believe that enabling this feature should be set on by default, but that the setting should actually be changed to something like increased frights instead. As it is now, with the box checked, the enemies make less noise to avoid jump scares. They also don't run and lunge at you after you are spotted and simply walk towards you at a pace you can outmatch, and generally are much easier to lure and avoid. This setting is integral to the enjoyment of these sections in my opinion. It becomes more about avoiding them than it is about smashing your face into the wall repeatedly hoping to finally survive the encounter. Frankly, it can become tedious getting your lantern blown out constantly because they can outrun you while you're running blind unable to see where you're going. The only way I could reconcile the setting in its current state is if you weren't slowed down while focusing the lantern. If you're going to make enemies run faster than you, the least they can do is make it easier to see where you're going so you have a better chance. I mean, think about it. If you slow to a crawl when you focus the lantern, but they're running at the same speed if not faster when they have it focused on you, this will result in a lot of failures. And frankly, it becomes more annoying than it does scary, which should obviously defeat the purpose. That's why I think that the standard mode should actually be turned into a sort of quote-unquote hard mode. This setting would be for those who like a challenge in running in the dark, or for people that like to waste their time for bragging rights. Not knocking it, just saying that there's people out there that play games on hard difficulty just because they want the challenge, no matter how time consuming it becomes. When I turned on the setting, I was really confused if I was going to miss out on any content by switching it on, only to find out I didn't. So I turned it on and never looked back. Well, except for the times I look back and see enemies actually far behind for once, which was very nice. I do appreciate the inclusion of the setting, of course. I just think that it could have been changed a little bit to address these concerns. This prior knowledge of the horror aspects both hinders and helps the DLC. When I first explored the empty buildings of the stranger, I was made very uncomfortable early on. The fact that all of the furniture was taller than the player height, the ominous faded portraits that are hung on the walls, and the decrepit condition that the buildings were all in contributed to the ever-present sense of dread, even before you encounter any enemies. I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that this moment was when everyone was put on notice, and the realization sunk in that these guys on the screen are likely our adversaries, not our friends. There are several moments such as this that show the stranger's inhabitants having a dark side to them, which is ironic since all of their technology is based on light. The burn slides and the music that accompanies them also give an unsettling feeling, even though it's initially believed to be due to environmental damage. So, knowing that it was going to be spooky kept me on edge for almost all of the playthrough, even before I learned of the dream world. Simply having the knowledge that all of the horror scenes don't happen on the stranger itself is what could have set my mind at ease. But I didn't know that, and that's its biggest strength. I expected at some point those guys were going to come after me, and I would have to beeline to my ship in the darkness to escape if at all possible. And as a result in the previous section, 
It was good that they didn't, but the idea kept me on edge until I realized it. It's also important to acknowledge the irony of the stranger's inhabitants. Their technology is based on light, but by design, all of their truth is obscured in darkness. Just like the stranger's cloaking ability appearing as a black void, or removing the lanterns to reveal the congregation rooms, or descending into dark passageways to reach a record room, or jumping off the raft during the dark loading time between the dream world locations, or having to darken the hidden real locations in order to obtain the forbidden slideshows. Or, and probably the most impressive and impactful moments of the entire game, is when you leave your lantern behind. In an area where you can't see, and you're in constant danger of getting caught, why would you think to put down your lantern? This is probably the easiest dream world bug to stumble upon, but it still requires you to set down your one light source and walk forward into the darkness. And you are rewarded with knowledge of the true nature of this world. In fact, there's a dev interview that I listened to shortly after I wrote this script that explained the constant theme of the truth is hidden in the dark. Which proves that this was very deliberate and very well done. The horror was created to reinforce that theme. And even though I would prefer it if enemies didn't aggro at all, because truth be told, I hate horror games, as I hate being chased in them. But that's what kept me going. I needed to find the truth. Even if I had to traverse the darkness to get it. A lot like the base game, huh? Similar, but you get the idea. And still, after conquering the darkness and completing the DLC, the prisoner stands with you at the eye of the universe if you complete the game again like normal after releasing him. In a DLC that some would be discouraged to play because of this tonal shift into the horror genre, such as myself, I find it fitting that these are the last words that the prisoner tells you. Whatever happens next, I do not think it is to be feared. I finished off my prior video on Outer Wilds by saying this. Outer Wilds touched my heart in ways I didn't know video games could. It stimulated my mind in ways I could only hope more games will replicate in the future. The Echoes of the Eye did neither. But what it did do was make me appreciate the formula that Outer Wilds created. All throughout this video I have explained how the DLC takes inspirations from the base game, but tries to do them differently. The main issue for me is that the DLC was, quite frankly, pandering to me. I don't blame the devs because their goal was met. The purpose of the DLC was fulfilled. And I still had a blast with it. And yet, I can't shake this feeling that it couldn't match this world-changing solar system. This patchwork mega-narrative. With its own set of contrivances, but ones that were easily ignored because of the childlike wonder that the base game fostered. In this DLC, due to the very nature of being just a DLC expansion, it loses that childlike wonder. All of a sudden, you're not looking through your monitor into another world. You're looking at a video game that happens to have more content. And suddenly, one of the things I loved most about the base game was gone. There were several times while exploring The Stranger where I felt like the devs made a puzzle for me to solve. Let me say that again. A mystery was crafted specifically for me, the player, to unravel. Not the hatchling. Not the alien that came from Timber Hearth. The player. I hope you understand the issue I'm describing here. While Outer Wilds was an archaeological dig, the Echoes of the Eye was an Easter egg hunt. The mystery that was provided was fun and interesting. But ultimately, even though it was enjoyable, it doesn't have the same impact because of its purpose. A lot like the dream world itself, the experience was artificial and manufactured, just but a shadow of the main game. I came to this conclusion for this reason. The motivations of the artists are understandable, but their methods to achieve their goals are not believable. And when you shatter the suspension of disbelief, then you can no longer be immersed, and then you see the artificial world for what it really is. You would think that knowing about a third race in Outer Wilds would be huge, game-changing even. Or the fact that the prisoner is the reason why the Nomai caught the signal of the eye in the first place. 
The eye wasn't reaching out to the Nomai. The signal just managed to escape, thanks to the prisoner. This guy is the reason your journey ever happened. He is the reason you are even capable of reaching the eye and birthing a new universe. This profound addition to the base game cannot be understated. And it's the one part of the DLC that actually matters. Everything else can be described as simply gameplay filler. It's damn good filler, but it's still isolated and doesn't hold much weight. It's just sitting there, cloaked to be nearly invisible. And you can even tell the prisoner to disappear at the climax of the greatest game ever made. It's poetic, really. And I'm probably taking this too far, but that just goes to show that I care a lot about this game. The funny thing about all this is that I still recommend everyone that has the base game to get the DLC. It doesn't have to be perfect. And it doesn't have to be game of the year. It doesn't even have to be Outer Wilds 2.0. That's okay. And when the artists were creating the dream world, I'm sure they had a similar sentiment. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing, as long as it reminds us of home. My name's Aeon, thanks for watching.